Bienvenue tout le monde à ce séminaire de thématique physique de cette semaine. C'est mon plaisir d'introduire Luca de la Creta, qui est un physicien suisse qui fait présentement son postdoc à l'Université de Chicago. Il est McCormick Postdoctoral Fellow au Enrico Fermi Institute. Puis avant, Luca a fait son doctorat à Stanford avec Sean Hartnell, right, Luca? Oui, c'est um, Il a travaillé sur uh, différents aspects um, du transport dans les systèmes quantiques fortement corrélés, incluant les systèmes uh, holographiques, donc écrits par la dualité ADS et FT, mais pas seulement. Um, puis, il a fait ses études précédemment uh, en Suisse, uh, plus précisément à l'École polytechnique uh, fédérale de Lausanne. Et euh, c'est ça. Donc, Lucas est un expert euh, sur euh, les systèmes quantiques fortement corrélés, les CFT, euh, mais pas seulement. Et aujourd'hui, on va apprendre. Euh, we'll speak English today. We'll hear about uh, Fermi liquids and uh, new approach to study them, which is uh, nonlinear bosonization. This is work with uh, Dan Son and company from Chicago. So, Lucas, Super. please uh, take over. Et merci pour l'invitation de parler, euh, euh, enfin de donner ce séminaire. Euh, J'ai eu le plaisir de visiter le centre de recherche mathématique il y a deux ans et demi, juste avant euh, cet apocalypse. Euh, J'espère pouvoir revenir bientôt, mais pour l'instant, ce sera, ce sera via Zoom. Euh, J'espère que vous n'en avez pas encore marre des, <rire> des séminaires euh, par Zoom. Euh, donc, le séminaire sera en, en anglais, mais n'hésitez pas à poser vos questions en français si vous, euh, si vous préférez. So, I will be talking about... Uh, ongoing work and upcoming work on, on Fermi liquids with these fantastic collaborators. Uh, let, me, let me highlight the, the junior collaborators, Ixian Du and Umang Meta, who are graduate students at the University of Chicago, uh, and they will be applying soon, so keep your, your eyes out for them. Um, so I was told that this would be a, a pretty mathematical audience, um, so you might not be familiar with what a Fermi liquid is. So for the mathematicians, let me, um, let me make it easier and uh, define Fermi liquids as uh, co-joint orbits of canonical transformations. So that will be one of the, the uh, kind of um, bottom lines of, of my talk, that, that there's a kind of ident identification between, between these, two, these two objects. Now, uh, physicists might not know what co-joint orbits are, and mathematicians might have not much uh, idea of what Fermi liquids are, but hopefully I'll, I'll explain uh, both sides in, in more detail. Okay, as in between, can I just ask you, I mean, co-joint yeah. Orbit is always a group. So, what's the group? Yeah. Canonical transformations. So, the group, the group. Oh, oh, the infinite yeah. group of the infinite group of canonical transformations. Yeah. I see. Which I drew oh, as a sphere here. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Um, good. So now, now the talk's over. You, <laughs> you, you can, you can go home. Um, no. So, so, and, and beyond just uh, identifying these two sites, uh, I'll show you that it's really a useful um, way to think about Fermi liquids, and that we'll be able to actually make very concrete calculations um, and to perform calculations that are very hard to do. Uh, with other methods and often impossible. Um, so it's really a, a useful framework. Um, so, uh, so I think this talk, on, on one hand, it will fit in very well with uh, this, um, this, the, for, for this uh, seminar series, because there's going to be some nice math in addition to, to nice physics. But on the other hand, unfortunately, it's going to be given by a physicist. And so inevitably, I'm going to butcher a lot of the, the beautiful mathematics. And I apologize in advance uh, for that, but um, feel free to interrupt at any point with, uh, with questions. OK, so, I'm here again. Okay. <laughs> uh, so you say cogent orbits of canonical yeah. transformation. Canonical transformations need a phase space. So what is your phase space? What is the phase space on which uh, the so canonical transformation is acting? Um, let me let me postpone this question uh, for for now, okay? Because I, I think I'll be able to. Uh, so they're, they're going to be the cogent orbits of of uh, a state that the Fermi liquid describes, and I'll hopefully I'll hopefully address. Uh, Your, your, your question uh, later on. If not, ask again. Okay. And, and, but, but the phase space is, is, is uh, oh, you were asking about the phase space, sorry. Yeah, so, so, so a Fermi liquid in two dimensions, this will be the two dimensional phase space. So functions of X and P with X in two dimensions on the plane P in two dimensions, if, if that was the question. Sorry, X and T? X and P. Uh, uh, the, the phase the space has to have a, it's got to have the, uh, symplectic or a yes. boson structure. Yes, yes, it does. So, uh, Position and momentum. 
but let me postpone this question for now if it's not yeah this was just meant as a kind of uh, uh, flashy first slide but but I'll, I'll go into details but okay let, let me start by explaining how physicists think about Fermi liquids so um, um, and, and let's start uh, uh, nice and easy let's just consider free fermions so for example free electrons uh, and let me put an electron in a box so the ground state of the system will, will look like this. This will be the weight function of the electron. It's going to occupy the, to minimize its energy, it will take the, it will try to have the, you know, its kinetic energy is going to have the uh, largest wave vector it can have, um, allow, uh, you know, uh, that still respects the boundary conditions. And so if I, if I draw this, this state of this electron in, um, in momentum space, it's going to occupy points over here um, at momentum pi over L. Now, if I put an, another electron in this box, um, because of the Pauli exclusion principle, it won't be allowed to occupy the same state. So it's going, its momentum, so to minimize its energy, it's going to occupy the next lowest energy state, which will have um, twice the momentum in one of the directions. Um, here, I'm ignoring the spin of the electrons, because it, so if we take spin into account, there's really two states for momentum state, but, but let's just ignore this for now. Um, if I add a third electron in the box, it's going to again, occupy another um, free, free state, and, and so on. So if I keep on adding electrons in, in my box, they're going to occupy more and more momentum states, and I can keep on going. And again, due to the Pauli exclusion principle, they really have to build up um, their, their momentum. But the total momentum of the system is still zero, uh, approximately. So I keep on adding electrons. And at some point, if I add so many electrons, uh, it's going to be useful to think of this, this kind of sea of electrons as a continuous um, object. So here I'm, I'm assuming there's a kind of large number of electrons in the box. And, and here there's an important um, dimensionful uh, quantity, which is the Fermi wave vector, Kf. Okay. So implicitly, I'm assuming that the, this wave vector is large compared to the, the volume of my box. This is what implies that the um, number of, of total number of electrons is large. So these systems are, are gapless. In fact, they're very gapless in some sense. Um, in particular compared to uh, quantum field theories that one encounters in particle physics. Uh, and the reason is that there are many low energy excitations on top of the state, which correspond to uh, taking an electron near the Fermi surface, near the edge of this Fermi C, and, and putting, it, uh, um, um, putting it in one of the unoccupied states just above the, the Fermi surface. Okay, these are called particle hole excitations. And there's really a lot of possibilities for these particle hole excitations because the Fermi surface is so big. So this is in contrast to kind of regular quantum field theories, say like the standard model, where you have particles, you know, you have a bunch of particles, but they're, they, they all, their low energy excitations are all at low momentum and there's just much less space space for them. So these systems are in some sense less gapless. So Fermi liquids are very gapless states of matter because they have all these low energy excitations. And you can think of these excitations, these particle hole excitations, as kind of motions of the Fermi surface, okay, deformations of the Fermi surface, like this, that pre preserve its volume. So there's one important quantity in a Fermi in a Fermi liquid um, that I mentioned before, the Fermi wave vector, this dimensionful um, uh, wave vector that we have we have here. And um, um, so this begs the question: Is there a simplified effective description of the system where you don't have to care about all the individual, you know, many electron states uh, at long distances, at distances long compared to one over Kf. And uh, there is, and this effective description is uh, basically Fermi liquid theory. So the idea is that if you have a very big um, volume, so let's say I have a, a very big container, here are the x and y directions, then I can separate it into a bunch of smaller volumes, slightly smaller volumes of size um, xi. And if xi is still much bigger than 1 over kf, then I can still play the same game I played before in this smaller volume and define a Fermi surface in this volume. Okay? So, so this is a, inherently a semi-classical picture where I'm using both uh, momentum space and, and position space. Um, and I'm allowed, the, the reason I can do this is that there's this large number kf. So now we really have a local kind of Fermi surface okay, in, in all of these boxes. And in particular, things can start to depend on space. So for example, the Fermi surface might look a little different over here. Here in this example, I, I drew more electrons with momentum towards the right. Over here, there are more electrons with the momentum towards the left. So if I time evolve this state, they're both gonna flow towards the middle um, so that there's gonna be more charge over here. Uh, and so this, what this is described by is, is some kind of continuity relation 
um, called the, the Boltzmann equation or the kinetic uh, equation. So it's a continuity relation for the occupation number or the, the distribution function that tells you how many states um, have momentum P at location X. Okay, and it satisfies this type of continuity relation. So all this so far is for free fermions, um, but the, the genius of, La of Landau in the, in the 40s was to realize that in, in many situations, uh, when you have interactions on, even though in principle, you, you might imagine that there's gonna be some complicated uh, collision kernel in the Boltzmann equation, um, very often the effects of this kernel uh, effectively are, are very simple and can be kind of taken into account uh, with small changes to this uh, kinetic equation. I, I won't go into the details now, but basically there's a kind of series of, of, of uh, a set of Landau parameters um, that, that one has to take into account, but otherwise basically the description doesn't change. Fermi liquids are still described by this type of kinetic equation. So Fermi liquid theory has been extremely successful over, um, over the years. Probably the textbook example is in liquid helium in helium-3. So the, the helium atom has a single uh, neutron. So it has an odd number of uh, fundamental um, fermions. So it's a fermionic object. Uh, and so if you put a lot of them and cool them down to low enough temperature, it forms a Fermi liquid. And um, a lot of predictions from Fermi liquid theory are, are borne out in this, in this system. So for example, the fact that it's very gapless can be seen in the specific heat, which is linear in temperature. This is in contrast to the specific heat of, uh, of you know, um, um, more particle-like systems, like or phonon systems, for example, where, where it's going to go with some higher power of temperature. Um, so uh, uh, here at very low temperatures, the specific heat is very high for Fermi liquid, and this is is one way to see that it's very gapless. Okay, it really responds to uh, external perturbations in a very strong way. Um, one can, one has, we have also observed uh, collective excitations in any helium that basically come as predictions from, from this uh, kinetic equation. Um, Landau parameters have been measured. These are things that, so helium is not a system of free fermions, they're interactions, in fact, rather strong interactions. And so because of this, it's a Fermi liquid and uh, Fermi liquids have these additional Landau parameters compared to, a, to free fermions. Um, and, and, and finally, some out of equilibrium properties of, of liquid helium have, can also be measured, like viscosity, uh, and, and these all um, agree with Fermi liquid predictions. Uh, but the reason condensed matter physicists really care about Fermi liquids is not just helium; it's because Fermi liquids describe essentially any metal that you can um, that you can find. Uh, so, of course, metals are, are a little more complicated than liquid helium. They have less symmetries. There's a lattice. Uh, and so on. And, and, and for example, um, Fermi surfaces for these reasons will look uh, different. They might not have all the symmetries that you would have in, in helium, but uh, up to a few minor changes in, in Fermi liquid theory, uh, this general framework, this paradigm can still be used to understand that. And uh, in particular in metals, because the fermions are charged, um, you, you can actually, uh, um, th there's a lot of different types of measurements you can make and, and many predictions of Fermi liquid theory can be observed um, in metals as well. Now, not everything is a Fermi liquid, and probably what has captured the attention of many um, condensed matter physicists over the past few decades are, are systems that go beyond, beyond the Fermi liquid paradigm. So there's reasons both experimentally and, and theoretically to, to think that, um, to believe that you know, there is more to life than Fermi liquids. Um, experimentally, one of the driving forces has been um, has been high temperature superconductors, and in particular what's called the normal phase of high temperature superconductors. So at temperatures above the critical temperature, where it's no longer superconducting. These systems, um, so they, they've been called strange metals because they have some features that look a bit metallic. They have, uh, it seems that they have something like a, a Fermi surface, but their thermodynamics and transport properties are not at all those of a, a Fermi liquid. So uh, understanding what kind of phase of matter um, these could be, it has led to a lot of, of research on going beyond Fermi liquids. And isn't there an energy gap then for mass gap? There's no mass gap. It's also at, at pretty high temperature, but, but yeah, there, there's, there's no, no mass gap. I mean, okay. I mean, in ordinary because, superconductors you do. Oh, oh, in the, yeah, in the superconducting state, there's a, there's a gap. There's, you know, the, it's a D-wave superconductor, but there, there's, there's a gap here. Here I'm talking in, about the normal states. Okay. So, so above the superconducting temperature. Um, okay, but even on the theory side, there's good reasons to, to, um, to think about 
going beyond Fermi liquid because if you in in two uh, plus one dimension, if you take a, a Fermi liquid um, theory and you couple it to a gapless boson, so to a, a boson that you tune whose, whose correlation length you tune to infinity, uh, this has a relevant it, this is a relevant interaction. And so it uh, typically leads, it triggers a, a renormalization group flow to uh, a, a strongly coupled uh, infrared fixed point, which has been um, called non Fermi liquid fixed points with a lot of imagination. Um, so this, this fixed point is kind of similar to things like, you know, the 3D Ising CFT or, um, or ON Wilson Fisher models, in that it's a strongly interacting system that's um, that may or that probably doesn't have quasi particle excitations and um, has some kind of scaling to it. But in some sense, it's much more complicated than these CFTs because it has less symmetries. There's a finite, there's still this finite uh, scale, you know, the, the Fermi wave vector, which uh, makes a, a general scaling analysis pretty complicated. So, okay, so those are all reasons to think about uh, non Fermi liquids, but also to care about Fermi liquids because all of these are kind of obtained from Fermi liquids. In fact, uh, Phil Anderson, who was probably one of the first to um, to really stress the importance of, 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 of going beyond Fermi liquids to understand the um, high temperature superconductors, also advised us to know the enemy, uh, namely Fermi liquids, um, and, and uh, uh, to, to understand, you know, to eventually understand non-Fermi liquids. And um, I, I think we actually don't know the enemy well enough. In particular, we don't even really have an action principle um, for Fermi liquids, uh, a, a convenient action principle for Fermi liquids. And what this talk will be about is uh, uh, an effective field theory that really provides a kind of general uh, paradigm or general action principle for Fermi liquids, and which can then be used you know, to couple to other, systems, to, to other um, fields to, to study potentially non-Fermi liquids. Um, but this talk will be mostly, will be. Uh, essentially only about the Fermi liquid aspect of it. So, okay, so what is effective field theory? Um, so one way I like to think about effective field theory is that it's a, it's a microscopic insouciant description of a system based on general principles like, like symmetries. And um, the, so the hope in effective field theory is to kind of, ex to, 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 um, to, to kind of recast your system in terms of variables that are, that are weakly interacting and it will have uh, um, and, and whose dynamics will be will be fixed by symmetries. So a hard step in effective field theory is to identify these variables. Um, so one situation where we know how to do this very well is when there's spontaneous symmetry breaking. So spontaneous symmetry breaking arises in you know all uh, subfields of, of physics, from statistical physics to high energy physics. Um, for example, here in condensed matter physics, I, I um, uh, wrote down this example of spin waves in a ferromagnet. Uh, in high energy physics, pions and QCD are, are an example. And in all of these cases, um, Goldstone's theorem guarantees that there will be uh, weakly interacting gapless excitations associated basically with the broken symmetries. So one way to parameterize- so This is not a gauge theory. This is uh, not, well, it could arise from a gauge theory, but the, but the then you have theory is not a gauge theory. But, but then the you do have a mass scale. No, no, yeah, the, the, these symmetries are global symmetries. There could also be gauge symmetries, but, but here I'm focusing on the global symmetries. Okay, so it's Goldstone or Higgs? Goldstone, not Higgs. Not Higgs. Yeah, so like pions in QCD or, 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 or spin waves in a ferromagnet where there isn't a dynamical, you know, SU2 gauge field. Yeah, so these, these are gapless excitations. Um, and so in, in all these cases, we can parameterize these low energy excitations uh, in terms of broken symmetries, or more precisely as the quotient space of the global symmetry you have in the microscopics um, mod the um, unbroken symmetry. Okay, so for example, in a ferromagnet, we have a, a spin pointing in some direction, so it breaks SU2 down to a, a U1 symmetry. And then you can write down, so the, the idea then is to write down the, um, um, an effective field theory for these degrees of freedom that respect the symmetry. So this is what it looks like for, um, for these systems. Um, so these are these are really, although they look very simple, these actions, they're really nonlinear uh, actions. Those are nonlinear, you know, nonlinear sigma models because, uh, for example, this this vector n is, uh, you know, lives on the sphere. It has unit uh, norm. And so there's some nonlinear aspect to it. And what's kind of beautiful about these theories is that the nonlinear structure is really fixed by, by symmetries. Now, something that often happens in these effective field theories is that there are special terms um, called westumino witten terms. Uh, for example, for, for pions, there's a, a famous term that looks like this, 
which is associated with the, the chiral anomaly of the underlying um, fermion uh, theory. And for ferromagnets, there is this uh, very phase-like term, which, uh, which leads to the omega equals k squared dispersion of, of, of ferromagnets. Um, so these are terms that are allowed by symmetry. Some, often they, they, uh, the Lagrangians are not invariant under the symmetry. They're only invariant up to a total derivative, but the action is still, is still invariant. Um, but one shouldn't stop here. The, the uh, spirit of effective field theory is to write down the most general thing that's, uh, that's compatible with symmetries. And so usually there is an infinite tower of uh, more and more irrelevant operators with more and more gradients um, uh, in, in, in some kind of expansion. But uh, this doesn't mean that there's no that there's no control that this is useless. Even though there's an infinite number of you know terms, an infinite number of parameters, uh, at any order in the expansion, only a finite number will will matter. And so um, all these all of these uh, so all of these terms come with new coefficients, right? Um, which are typically order one coefficients in units of the cutoff of the of the effective field theory that I'll call lambda. And so and the reason I call uh, effective field theory Microscopics insouciant and not indifferent is that th these uh, coefficients will, in general, depend on the microscopics. But what's uh, the advantage of effective field theory is that it's really uh, the microscopic details only enter through a few Wilsonian um, coefficients. And so, with up to these few coefficients, there's a huge predictive power of effective field theory. Okay, so um, so how would we write down an effective field theory for Fermi liquids? So this has been uh, attempted in the past, in particular in this beautiful um, series of, of papers. And what they did is basically, you know, the, what you would what what you would probably um, first think of doing, namely writing down a theory of of interacting fermions. So here they're going to have a dispersion relation um, uh, that that goes to zero at the Fermi surface. So near the Fermi surface, it might look like something like P minus PF. And then just write the most general interactions you can for these, um, for these fermions. And uh, they wrote this in momentum space. It turned out to be um, convenient to do it in this way. And what they found, so what was kind of beautifully reproduced in this work is that under renormalization, they found that um, of this whole function's worth of parameters, which depends on many, you know, many parameters, only the ones uh, related to Landau parameters, so only a small subset of them are, are marginal, and all the others are irrelevant. So only Landau parameters and, and uh, ECS couplings, which are responsible for the superconducting instability, can be shown to be, um, to be marginal, uh, whereas all the others are, are relevant. So this is, this is pretty nice, but there are several disadvantages to this approach. Um, the first obvious one is that this is really an interacting theory, right? So uh, there are interactions that are marginal. So, uh, Perturbation theory will, will be will be difficult. You'll have kind of interactions at the very beginning. Um, and yeah, basically, interactions are as important as the connector. Uh, another disadvantage is that, is that it's written in momentum space, which is you know a little different from these effective field theories that are usually written in position space. Um, so that makes the systematic expansion a little uh, more 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 subtle. So what I'll present? I just slip in another question. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I'm familiar with Bose Fermi equivalence in in uh, Two dimensions, but the, you're yes. in higher dimensions. Yes. yes. Uh, is this supposed to be equivalent to the nonlinear signal to the Witten Bessomino or something? Or is there no, I mean, is there any Bose Fermi equivalence here? Yes, yes. This talk will be about a Bose Fermi type. Uh, in higher dimensions. Uh, in higher dimensions, exactly, exactly. It won't quite be an equivalence, but but no, that's right. It will be, it will be, no, no, I, yeah, I, I think we can say it will be an equivalence. So it, we're, I'm going to recast Fermi liquid theory as a bosonic uh, theory. Um, uh, in fact, it's going to be an effective field theory for this for this parameter f, uh, and, and this will be in higher dimensions. But isn't there a problem with spin statistics in higher dimensions? Yes. So I won't be able to re to, to capture fermionic operators, but I will be able to capture any bosonic operators. So you know, uh, for example, the density two point function, things like this, and any bosonic correlation function will be uh, capturable. But I won't have access to fermionic operators. So it's not. I won't have the full power of that one has in one plus one dimensional bosonization. And yeah, that, that would be too much to hope for because of yeah, statistics. Um, so, so, okay, so, so indeed the, the approach I'm going to, um, to advocate is to write down an effective field theory directly for this kind of bosonic field, the, the distribution function. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll spend some time motivating why it's really advantageous to work with bosonic degrees of freedom. Um, those of you who know bosonization in one plus one dimension know that it, it gives you, you know, it, it can help a lot for, for many problems. It will be the case here too that it's uh, that many things can be done in, in these bosonic variables. 
So this will be our degree of freedom, basically this distribution function. Um, here for, you know, th 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 this, just to give you an example, it, it, for the example of, of a just a, a, a Fermi fluid at rest, it's equal to one in the Fermi C and equal to zero outside. So the degree of freedom won't quite be any single, uh, it, it's not the case that any function of X and P can be obtained um, from starting from uh, a Fermi liquid at rest and, and you know, um, evolving uh, in time or by any way. In fact, uh, one can show that the only types of functions that we'll be able to reach will still have this property that they're equal to one or zero, um, but their shapes can change and um, with the constraint that their volume will, will be the same. So really these, these functions, our degree of freedom will not quite be the space of all functions of X and P. It's going to be a kind of quotient space, the same way that the Goldstones were living in a quotient space. Uh, and more precisely, it's, it's the, the degrees of freedom are going to live in a co-joint orbit, which is a special kind of quotient space. And this effective field theory will have a fully nonlinear structure, just like nonlinear sigma models. And upon linearization, we'll see that it reduces to, um, to, uh, to theories that have been known of, of uh, kind of bosonization in, in higher dimensions. Um, so so these, uh, these theories that were, that were studied uh, were only in, were kind of free. So they were Gaussian in, in terms of this bosonic degree of freedom. And it was known that there should be some kind of nonlinear structure to it, but people hadn't quite figured how to um, fix this nonlinear structure. Uh, and that's what I'm going to show you today, how to kind of find the nonlinear completion um, for, for bosonization in higher dimension. Um, so before pausing for a question, let me just tell you what the plan is. So I'll, I'll start by further motivating why bosonization is useful. Um, and, and I'll take some examples in, in one plus one dimension. Um, then I'll show you how to uh, actually get this effective field theory using, using this formalism of co-joint orbits. And then finally, I'll show you how to use it and how and, and, and we'll see how it's actually really practical to do calculations which were extremely complicated otherwise. Uh, and and um, yeah, so we'll do that. But before that, let me let me pause um, for questions. Okay, so if there are no questions, I'll start with bosonization. And so let me let me say a few words on bosonization in one plus one dimension. So this is you can find this in many textbooks, um, but I think it's worth emphasizing because it's uh, it's it's quite beautiful and is related to what I'll be saying. So in one plus one dimension, bosonization is extremely powerful. It can solve problems that seem like they're interacting in, in fermion variables, but are um, often free in bosonic degrees of freedom. And even in the sim simplest case of free fermions, bosonization can actually be useful. So let me give you a, let me look at a very simple example here of a free Dirac uh, fermion. Um, so this can be equivalently expressed in terms of a free boson. Um, so both sides are free, so you might say, okay, it doesn't seem like one is particularly advantageous, but, but um, let's see. So uh, you can also map operators. So for example, the density operator is this fermion bilinear. Whereas on the boson side, uh, one thing that's nice is that the density operator is linear in the boson field. Okay, and it of course has to be bilinear in, in fermion variables. So now if we wanted to compute a two-point function of the density operator, for example, um, this would involve a, a loop calculation on the fermion side, okay, because we need, um, we'll, we'll have a fermion loop. Whereas on the boson side, it's just a tree-level um, diagram. In fact, it's so simple that we can even do it live. So the, the boson propagator is something like omega squared minus q squared. And then the density is q times the, the bosons, the two densities. Um, so two factors of q. Okay, so this is what this, this diagram will give you. Um, whereas on the fermion side, to obtain the same results, you'd have to compute this, um, this loop. So we already see that there's a, uh, you know, a minor advantage at the level of the two-point function, but things become much more uh, extreme for higher point functions. So let's say I want to compute the endpoint function of density. Now this will involve a fermion loop. Um, this fermion loop will have many propagators and internal propagators. And it's a quite difficult calculation. Whereas on the boson side, it's obvious that it's zero because the density is linear in the, in the boson field and there's no interactions. So there are no connected uh, endpoint functions for n larger than, than two. Uh, and in fact, if you compute this, uh, you'll actually, it, it, you can actually see that there are cancellations that happen once you uh, symmetrize properly the external legs. And this was realized in this paper, uh, but those are rather non-trivial to see. Uh, in the in the fermion description, um, so so already you know already to kind of analyze the simple problem, it seems that there is an advantage in the bosonic picture. Now, if we want 
Bosonization is also useful to study deformations of these theories. So let's say now I want to couple this theory to an external, to a photon, okay, a one plus one dimensional um, photon. So I'm, I'm kind of studying massless quantum electrodynamics in, uh, in one plus one dimension. Um, this is sometimes called the Schwinger model. Uh, and, and so let's say you want to prove the, the, um, uh, the fact that the Schwinger model is, is gapped. So in the fermionic description, this is what it looks like. We have a, a gapless, uh, we, we have a photon with the Maxwell kinetic term, the fermion we had before, and a coupling between the fermion and the gauge field. Uh, now this is a relevant interaction in one plus one dimension. And so, uh, you know, kind of naively, you might expect that it, so in the UV, you have a free fermion and a free photon, but you might expect that it flows to strong coupling uh, so that in the IR, you just lose all uh, predictive power. But now let's look at the boson side. So in the boson side, we can also couple the photon to the, to the current, um, but, but uh, the coupling looks much simpler. Uh, and this again follows from the fact that the current was, was linear in the, in the field. And, and so this is what the action looks like. The entire action is Gaussian, okay? So we can, we can, just, uh, we can just solve it. Uh, in fact, you can, uh, we can even uh, do a gauge transformation to, to get rid of, of phi, to eat up phi in, in A. And so this is what the, the action will look like after this gauge transformation. And so you immediately see that we have a gapped um, excitation with mass equal to e to the charge e. Okay, so we've solved, um, it's straightforward to solve this problem in the bosonic variables. So um, all this magic doesn't quite happen in higher dimensions. In particular, the cancellations in fermion loops that I described aren't, don't, don't quite happen. But it turns out that they still approximately happen. So there's still approximate cancellations in fermion loops uh, as a kind of leftover of what happened in, in one dimension. And, in, and these cancellations actually make perturbative analysis of, of Fermi systems, of Fermi liquids, non-Fermi liquids, quite difficult because uh, so, so you know if you if you need to study a, some endpoint function, let's say a four-point function, just knowing how this thing scales with uh, with the wave vector, you know, with the momentum you put in. So there's several momentum, let me just write one. Uh, how this scales with, with uh, Q of Kf. So this we can't fix by dimensional analysis, right? It's some dimensionless number. Knowing how this scales with Q over Kf is highly non-trivial because there's lots of cancellations happening and, uh, and it, it's typically scales with a smaller power. Uh, so it's typically more suppressed than, than what you might expect. And this makes perturbative analysis quite subtle because let's say you're now coupling, you know, your Fermi liquid to a gauge field, like I did in one dimension. So you would want to compute diagrams, you know, that look like this, plus um, plus things like this, and so on. But um, if the firm, if, if this if this uh, four point function, you know, uh, has has approximate cancellation, so it's much smaller than than expected. This is going to lead to cancellations between these two diagrams because these involve. A, a, a four point function, right? There's a firm, fermion loop with four insertions. And so this will be much suppressed, more suppressed. So in the limit where this diagram is zero, this would just be zero. Um, but more precisely, there's gonna be cancellations and, and uh, um, the, the, the leftover, you know, it's, it's pretty difficult to find what the, the remaining part of these diagrams is. On the other hand, in the bosonic description, the scaling of these endpoint functions is entirely um, uh, straightforward, entirely transparent, and uh, the, the reason is that um, is that the cancellation. So, uh, as we saw in in um, the example of the Dirac fermion, the the cancellations just came from the fact that the boson theory was free, and in this case where there's approximate cancellations, they'll come from the fact that the boson bosonic theory has uh, small irrelevant interactions. So, the bosonic theory, instead of being exactly free, as we'll see. Um, we'll have some small interactions. These will be um, irrelevant in the, in the RG sense. So they only lead to small corrections to most observables, but they will give the leading contribution to things like nonlinear response. So this is going to give a, a cubic vertex that looks like this, um, which will give the leading contribution to, say, the density free point function. And the scaling with, with KF will be straightforward because, uh, yeah, because KF just appears outside of the action. There's no, there's no possible. Um, there's no possible confusion. So, can, can I just ask, yeah. Uh, yeah. so I'm familiar with bosonization in two dimensions, yeah. and there you really have an isomorphism, the bosonic yeah. uh, Fox space and the fermionics Fox space. 
yeah. are isomorphic and every operator goes to an operator, etc. Yeah. However, local things go to non-local things. Right. Yeah. But it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Yeah. So uh, what happens in higher dimensions? Do you have a correspondence between the Fox spaces or between the operators or what can you correlate? Yeah, so you, I, I think you might, so you, you definitely don't have a correspondence between the full Fox space because you don't have the fermionic states on the boson side. But I think uh, you, you could um, hope to have the all bosonic operators. And in fact, you know, in some cases, the fermion field is not gauge invariant. So if you're coupling it to a, a gauge field, it, it won't be gauge invariant. So there are, in this case, there are no fermionic operators uh, or fermionic states in the Fox space, in the, in the Hilbert space. And then I think you might actually have the entire entire Hilbert space. But what is the rule for uh, connecting the uh, the correlation functions? So well, I, I'm um, the rule is to use symmetries. Okay, so so uh, for example, a simple example is just the current. Okay, the current for for the U one U one symmetry is is clear to identify on both sides because it's some it's some holy operator that you know is is uh, properly normalized, and so there, there's no possible mistake. And then if you're interested in more complicated operators, I, I think the rule is to use symmetries. So the, um, it, the and, and this is really the kind of effective field theory approach. You might not know exactly what the operator corresponds to in the bosonic picture, but you'll write down the most general operator you can that has the same symmetries. And, and maybe there'll be a few coefficients that you can't fix. That would be the rule to compute the, you know, if you're interested in some complicated, um, uh, Sorry, some complicated operator on the fermion side that's still bosonic. Okay, something like this. I don't know. And you want to know what this maps to on the boson side. I would just write all possible operators that have the same quantum numbers uh, and uh, in, an in a gradient expansion and, um, and up to coefficients that I don't know, Wilsonian coefficients. Um, I know that the correlation function of my operator and that fermionic operator will have to match at low energies. So it's not an exact map. It's more. It's really an effective field theory approach where you. Uh, so it's similar to you know how let's say you, you're working in QCD at at um, at low energies where you have uh, chiral symmetry breaking. So your degree of freedom is is the these pions e to the you know, e to the pi, pi a t a, uh, and you, let's say you're interested in the correlation function of some gauge invariant uh, uh, QCD operator. Well, what you'll do is you'll just write down the most general thing you can using u, using your degree of freedom uh, and derivatives, things like this. So if there's some spin, you know, uh, and and there will be corrections, right? There's going to be u dagger d squared d mu u, and all of these will come with unknown coefficients, except if there are things like protected things like currents. But in general, there, there's going to be unknown coefficients. Uh, and then the claim is that in QCD you would reproduce correlation functions of this gauge invariant QCD operator using your pion degrees of freedom. So it's not, it's not really an exact map at the level of, you know, the Hilbert spaces match. It's more of a, I can reproduce any correlation function with a few fitting parameters. The, and the fitting parameters are, are these kind of operator matching coefficients, C1, C2, and so on. Okay, but I'm, in the examples I'll talk about, I'll mostly talk about the current, the, the density. In this case, there's no fitting parameter. The density, I know how to normalize it on both sides. So I'll really be able to compute this uh, three-point function of density in the bosonic picture with no uh, fitting. So, okay, uh, I'm, I'm a, little bit, uh, a little, little bit lost in what, is, uh, what, what the ingredients have to be, but uh, you're always talking about a bosonic effective field theory, is that right? Yes, yes. Uh, but there's no fermionic field That's theory right. picture. Uh, and nevertheless, you're able to make an identification between correlation functions. Of bosonic operators. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I, I won't, yeah, I'm not, uh, I won't be able to reproduce single particle, for example, or yeah, from correlation functions of fermionic operators, of course, but yeah. But I claim that any bosonic correlation function I can Reproduce. But I thought you were saying the computation was easier on the bosonic side than yes. on the long side. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, much easier. So, so here, and I think really this example of the density is is, is a good one. It's going to be similar to what, what I'll be saying. So here, this is a, you know, on this side, you don't even need to, in this whole slide, I didn't use uh, vertex operators, right? I didn't actually have to make use of uh, fermionic operators. I was just comparing correlation functions of a bosonic operator 
which looks pretty sim simple on both sides. And there's, yeah, it looks pretty simple on both sides. And, uh, and I'm saying the calculation is drastically simpler on the bosonic side. So this is going to be very similar. I'll have bosonic operators. They, they'll look simple on both sides. But correlation functions, ca calculating correlation functions will be vastly simpler in the bosonic description. OK, maybe let, let me move on. So, so there's, um, there's going to be several sources of these nonlinearities. Uh, I, I showed you in the previous si slide that in some cases, in 1D, in some cases, the, the, the bosonic theory is entirely Gaussian. Um, in higher dimensions, this will never be the case. But there's, you can kind of identify two types of sources of nonlinearities. One is just one is one that already arises in, in one dimension, which is uh, if your dispersion relation of fermions is not relativistic, so if you don't have a linear dispersion. And so in fact, in, in 1D, it's, our, it's, it's in fact well known that if you have something like, let's say, a fermion with a non-relativistic dispersion relation, um, this maps to a boson, which is, which is interacting. And in fact, we even know what the interactions look like. Roughly, it's going to have something, you know, something like this. Um, so this is an example where the dispersion relation um, is non-relativistic, and more generally, there's some there's some map between the dispersion relation and interactions in the boson side. So this something like this will also happen in higher dimensions. But something that is unique to higher dimensions is the fact that the geometry of the Fermi surface will lead to universal nonlinearities, and this is going to be through something like a Westumino Witten term, um, similar to the the ones I alluded to before. So these are nonlinearities that are completely unavoidable, and they're universal in that they only depend on the shape of the Fermi surface and not, and not things like uh, the dispersion relation. So our approach is really uh, the, the, the point, the, the, I guess, the main result of our work is to capture these nonlinearities um, systematically. OK, so um, if there are um, no questions on, on this, I'll, I'll move on to how we actually get the effective field theory. So the first step in effective field theory is, is identifying the right degree of freedom. And here, Landau did the work for us. Um, he identified this kind of distribution function as uh, you know, a kind of nice degree of freedom to work with for Fermi liquids. And in the so let's if we first consider the special case of free fermions, there we even know the equation of motion that this distribution function would satisfy. Um, so if we have a free fermion Hamiltonian that has some dispersion relation and some external potential, then this distribution function will satisfy the Boltzmann equation. Okay, which looks like this. There's this velocity term, and this is sometimes called the force term coming from the external potential. So we even know the equation of motion, but it's not obvious how to get an action principle that will reproduce this equation of motion. So that, that will be um, our, our first goal. Um, now, let, let's think a bit about our degree of freedom. So as I mentioned before, not any function of x and p will be reached, can, can be reached from uh, in this dynamics. So, so if we start from a kind of a state um, of a Fermi liquid at rest, where f is equal to 1. Um, so I'll write it with the step function. f is equal to 1 if the momentum is smaller than pf, and it's equal to 0 um, otherwise. Um, the types of f that we can reach won't be completely arbitrary. So let's think a little bit about what types of f we can reach. So under time evolution, um, this, this equation of motion can be written um, um, schematically in this way. That, that will make it look, uh, makes it look a bit like a uh, Schrodinger equation. Except here, it's it's really a classical equation. So this commutator is is just the Poisson brackets. And so, so are you in one plus one dimension again? I'm in any dimension here. So let's let's be in two plus one to be concrete. But I could do this in any dimension. But but let's be two plus one for the drawings to work. Okay. So let's say I'm in two plus one. Um, but but it would apply anyways. So so and these yeah these are are, are dumb. So yeah I I won't be writing vectors everywhere. But these are really there should be vectors and norms like this. And, and these Fermi surfaces, just to be clear, have Px and Py. This is my Fermi moment. So this equation of motion uh, that I have here can formally be solved um, in this way. So here, this exponential really means kind of exponential of, of this adjoint action of, of Poisson brackets, uh, where my initial state, my initial condition is just a, a Fermi surface at rest. And so here we see that the states that will be uh, that will reach are kind of uh, are basically the orbits of this initial state f zero uh, under some group G that these things belong to. So let's figure out what this group G is. Um, so if I act if I time evolve with a, a Hamiltonian h one for some time and then a Hamiltonian h two, um, 
and, and then uh, reverse their, their order, I'll, I'll find what the commutation relation of these things are. And what you'll find using just this, this equation is that their commutation relation is the Poisson bracket. Okay, so this is the algebra. Um, H1, H2 minus one goes to two. So the algebra uh, little g is the algebra associated with Poisson brackets. I'll call it the, the Poisson algebra. And the associated group, big G, is the group of uh, canonical transformations in however dimensions I'm in. So here I'm in, I'm in two dimensions. So there's, there's two x's and two b's. Um, good. So our, our degrees of everything freedom. Everything is real here? F is and real? Everything is real, yes. And so E the H, H t obviously is not a unitary thing. Um, so here I mean, um, you would want me to write an I? Is that what you're? Well, I don't. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> asking what you're doing. But let, 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 let me. So, 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 yeah. Maybe, maybe I mean an I. No, no. I. I okay. I. I. The thing. What. Whatever would would make this real. So this thing I want it to expand to f zero plus uh, h um, f zero plus dot dot dot. Where this thing is the Poisson bracket. So, and I think it's fine like this because the time evolution of f doesn't have an I. So H is uh, right, right. Uh, anti-Hermitian. Yeah, thanks for the, for the questions. OK, so our degree of freedom is these, this orbit of F0 under the group G. Uh, and, and this is more properly called a co-joint orbit. Um, and we can parameterize it in, in various ways. So our F0 is this Fermi surface at rest. Um, and then we can think of a general F obtained from F0. So if this, um, if this over here is F0, then a general F uh, obtained from, from F0 will correspond to some U. And I can think of U as being in the group or alternatively as U being e to the phi with phi being uh, an element of the algebra. But, but more precisely, there's a, there's a, it's, it's a quotient space because um, uh, here U will be equivalent to not all, uh, several U's bring the same, bring F0 to the same F, okay? Because um, in particular, if I take a U prime that's equal to U times e to the alpha, and alpha commutes with F0, um, then in this case, F prime, which is U e to the alpha, F0 e to the minus alpha, U inverse, this thing is still F0, and so this thing is still F. Okay, so, um, so really my, my degree of freedom lives in a quotient space, oops, sorry, um, which is G mod H. Okay, so phi will be in something like G mod uh, H for the algebra. And so in fact, you can use the fact that uh, e to the phi is equivalent to e to the phi e to the alpha to, to uh, choose a representative of a parameterization for phi um, um, that's a bit simpler. So instead of having phi be an arbitrary function of both coordinate and momentum, you can actually use this redundancy to, to, to choose it to only depend on coordinate and the angle theta. Okay, so in this way, phi is a degree of freedom that depends on space time as usual and, uh, and otherwise just depends on the position on the Fermi surface. So in, in one plus one dimension, um, this is probably a more familiar picture. If you have a Luttinger liquid, you have two Fermi points instead of a Fermi surface. And your degree of freedom is something like phi left, phi right. Okay, so the analog of this is just a phi that depends on theta. Okay, so to recap, we have our algebra, which is the um, algebra of, uh, of Poisson uh, brackets. There's a subalgebra of it, which is the algebra that leaves the state F0 invariant, the stabilizer of the state. So little h commutator F0, 0. And then uh, F0 itself is a, is a sub uh, you know, uh, algebra of that algebra because it commutes with itself. So here I'd like to draw an analogy, which might be uh, more familiar of, um, with, with uh, ferromagnets. So in ferromagnets, we have a very similar structure, but it's, it's uh, in fact a little bit simpler. So the group in this case is SU2 uh, with generators. So here when you say A. G Poisson, you mean the canonical transformations for that Poisson bracket? Yes, yeah. yeah. The algebra whose commutators are, are Poisson brackets. So it's an infinite algebra. Um, and, I, and I'm maybe doing some illegal things with infinite algebras. I apologize for that. But, yeah. um, so, OK, fair magnets have uh, 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 are states with, where the spin points in some direction. So there's a, a state that breaks the symmetry, and it points in some direction. Let me call it 3. 
times some, you know, some magnetization. Um, so we have this state, the analog of S0 is this state, or is this generator, let me say, um, J3. And then the stabilizer is just, uh, again, J3. So in this case, H is equal to the group, and it's a subgroup of, of SU2. Okay. And in, in, Sorry, in I'm confused about what is infinite and what is finite. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought you said that G plus one was the, the, the infinite group of canonical yes. transformation. Yes, 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 correct. Yeah, yeah. Now you're speaking about something finite. So yes, 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 yes. This is just an analogy for, uh, I wanted to make an analogy with ferromagnets where I have SU2. Um, in, okay. in this analogy, everything is finite. But in the case that I'm interested in, the group is infinite. It's the group of canonical transformations. But what is H in the case of canonical transformation? It's the stabilizer of my state. So, um, so F0, remember, is, is this step function that's equal to 1 um, inside the Fermi surface and 0 outside. And so I can find H by looking for, let me, let me take uh, an element uh, E to the, or, or sorry, let me take some, some group element. Um, and let's, let's, so for it to be an H, uh, it needs to commute with, it needs to commute with F0. So the Poisson bracket of um, sorry, Poisson bracket of alpha with F0 has to be zero. Okay, so this will give you a condition. You can actually compute this. So it's gonna be gradient acting on alpha times grad phi on F0. The, the other term isn't there because grad X on F0 is zero since F0 just depends on P. And so this will give you a condition on alpha. Um, sorry, I don't have much space here, but, but basically it's gonna tell you that the gradient, um, so gradient of phi on F0 F0 only depends on the radial direction, on momentum in the radial direction. So the gradient of P on F0 will give me a delta function localized on the Fermi surface. And then uh, the gradient acting on alpha will be in the direction uh, normal to the Fermi surface. So it's going to look like this. Let me just draw what I'm doing. So here I have a little vector n hat, which is in the direction normal to the Fermi surface. So this will give me a condition on, on the functions, you know, on, on, on the functions alpha that, that commute with F0. And this will define what the stabilizer group H fits. So it's functions whose gradient at the Fermi surface uh, of batch. And they form a subgroup or subalgebra. <laughs> Okay, so in all these situations, uh, the degree, degree of freedom lives in, in a quotient space, and we can parameterize it either with, uh, you know, the kind of Goldstone-like field, the, um, the the element of the group, or the orbit of the order parameter. So now we'd like to write an effective field theory for um, this degree of freedom, and uh, so you know the approach is to write down every term that's uh, compatible with symmetry. So here we want you know it to be invariant under the symmetry H, which leaves the Fermi surface invariant. Um, uh, but it turns out that there is in part, there's a special term in this effective field theory for this type of symmetry structure, which is, uh, which is always there. It's a Westumino witten like term. For the ferromagnet, it's precisely the, the um, uh, you know, this, this very phase term that I wrote uh, before. And uh, in, in the math literature, it's, it's, uh, it's called sometimes the Kirillov or Kirillov Kostan Suryo uh, symplectic form. And it has the, the following form. So here, uh, um, U is, is my is my degree of freedom, uh, and this is what it looks like. And so you can check that it's invariant under uh, the group H, which acts on um, U in, in, in this way by right multiplication, because I can commute the E to the alphas around, and they'll commute, since they stabilize the F0, the, 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 the action will be invariant under, under this group. So this is a kind of special West Sumino Witten term that will be, that's allowed to be in a my effective field theory, and so generically it's going to, it's going to be there. But more generally, I can write down any other term that's invariant under um, the, the, the symmetry H. So the symmetry H acts non-trivially on, on phi or on U in this way. Um, so, so these are not invariant, but F, it leaves F invariant. Okay, that's precisely that. In fact, that's how it's defined. So an easy way to build the general, a general action is to just write the most general function or functional of, of, of little f. And, and uh, so uh, as a simple example, uh, a linear term I can write down for little f um, will have this form. Okay, so here I, I'm just um, 
writing down one possible uh, linear term, and I'll, I'll, I'll generalize it a bit. Um, so this action already, the, these two terms, this West Sumino Witten term and the linear term, you can check, I won't show it now in the interest of time, but you can check that the equation of motion for this action is exactly the uh, kinetic equation, um, which is going to look like grad p epsilon dot grad x f. So this is the action um, principle that we were looking for that reproduces free fermion physics, um, basically the kinetic description of, of, of free fermions. But here in the EFT approach, it's obvious uh, how one should generalize. One should just write down the most general um, thing that's uh, built out of this, this little f. Okay, so this was the linear term that we had before, the West Amino Witten term. But one can write down higher order terms, terms that involve several times, several distribution functions. And the kind of rule in effective field theory is to, to write these terms in a local way. So you can have gradients. I didn't write any gradients here, but, but otherwise it's, it's local. And the idea is that we haven't integrated out any gap plus degrees of freedom, so everything left should be um, local. And so for those who are familiar with Fermi liquid theory, uh, it, it will turn out that this, this, um, this F2 parameter will actually contain uh, the uh, well-known Landau parameters of Fermi liquid theory, okay, which arise for interacting with Fermi. But in general, we see that there's a bunch of other parameters. Um, so you know, again, like any effective field theory, it looks like an infinite tower of, 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 of terms. But for any, at any order in, in, uh, in the expansion, in the gradient expansion, so at any order you know, when you compute an observable at a certain order in Q over Kf, uh, only a, a finite or a smaller number of terms will, will matter. Okay, um, so, so this, is, this, is, uh, this is the effective field theory. Uh, in the remaining time, I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to use it because the point is not just to um, um, you know, find this kind of abstract object. I also claim that it's a very useful way to make very concrete practical calculations in Fermi liquid theory. And so to illustrate this, I'll focus on the part of the action that is there for, um, for, for free fermions. So um, just to simplify life for this talk. So I'm just going to consider this part of the action and do uh, a simple kind of sample calculation. Um, so this is the action. This is the West Sumino term that I wrote again, West Sumino Witten term. And here I wrote down the, uh, the linear uh, energy term that I had before. Um, this is this term. So I wrote it down slightly differently. Um, here, but, but, but it's really the same thing. So you can, you can uh, uh, by trace cyclicity, you can take the U across and, and this will look like trace um, F times epsilon. And here, this, this trace is really some kind of formal object uh, in, in the group of canonical transformations, which really means uh, an integral over X and P times these functions. Okay, so this is what I had written before. So, so here, um, I wanted to kind of, in the spirit of Blackboard's talk, which I, which I miss a lot, I wanted to go through a, a simple sample calculation with this, with this action. Uh, namely, what we're going to do is we're going to expand it to quadratic order in phi to see what kind of Gaussian approximation we, we have. And we'll see that we'll land on a, a, um, a well-known action in, the, in, this, uh, in the bosonization literature. So let's start by expanding this. So this to leading order in phi will look like phi dot. Um, so here, u is e to the i phi. And then, yeah. It's going to be a quadratic term that looks like this by commutator phi dot plus higher order terms. Um, so uh, the, the, the linear term is just a total derivative, so it won't uh, affect the dynamics. Let's focus on the, on the nonlinear term, on the quadratic term. So the quadratic part of the West Sumino term will look like one half. Um, let me use trace cyclicity to, to instead do the com compute the commutator at zero with phi. Here I just, uh, it's going to be simple to do it this way. And now let's compute this commutator. So this commutator is just a Poisson bracket, OK? Um, in fact, here, let me just, because I have a sign, let me just compute the commutator of phi with f0 instead, phi dot. OK, so this commutator is just a Poisson bracket. Um, so it's going to look like grad x phi dot grad p f0. Um, f0 is this, this function over here, a step function. Uh, it doesn't depend on x. That's why there's no term uh, with grad x on, on f0. So uh, uh, taking a gradient of p of, 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 of my f0 will, will give me a, a delta function okay, localized on the Fermi surface. And then um, the, the gradient acting on phi will be in the direction normal to the Fermi surface. So this is what it looks like here. Let me just draw it again. I have my Fermi surface. 
and n hat is a little unit vector uh, that points away from the Fermi surface. Okay, so this is what this commutator looks like. This is the Poisson algebra. Uh, so now we can perform this, this integral. So the, the trace, what does the trace mean again? Well, it means an integral over d2x d2p um, times this, this delta function dot. Uh, let me separate this integral in, in let me perform it in, um, in polar coordinates. Okay, and we can actually perform the radial integral because there, there's this step function. So let's do it, and this p will become pf. So what we'll find is pf over 2 integral dt d2x uh, d beta by dot n hat dot delta. Okay, this is the West Amino Witten term to, to leading order. Um, for those who are familiar with Bosonization in one dimension, it might remind you um, of, of how things look, look there. So in, in, in 1 plus 1d, um, a chiral boson has a term that looks like phi dot dx phi in the action. Okay, this is, this is kind of the analog of this term. Uh, okay, let's quickly look at, the, um, uh, at this term over here. So again, we can expand in phi. This will look like epsilon, epsilon phi plus one half, and so on. So let's focus on the quadratic term, okay? Um, so again, I can, uh, so let me write down this, this Hamiltonian term of the quadratic order. It looks like one half integral dt trace so here, let me again uh, move around the commutators to have a commutator with F0 and a commutator with epsilon. Uh, and I do this because uh, I already computed this commutator with F0. This is just a delta function on the Fermi surface, n hat dot quad phi. And then the commutator with epsilon, I can commute it, compute it similarly. So here, epsilon is the dispersion of the, the fermion. It only depends on the, on the radial momentum, just like F. Uh, if I assume rotation invariance. And so this will give me epsilon prime of p times n hat dot grad phi. Okay, let me again compute the integral over dp and, and, and dx. There's again a delta function that will kill the radial integral and I'll be left with um, pf over two integral dt, d2x, d theta, um, epsilon prime of pf, n hat dot grad phi. Okay, I might have lost everyone here, but uh, if you fell asleep, you can you can wake up now. So uh, the, the, what we did is we just expanded the the effective field theory I gave you to quadratic order in the field phi, um, and this is the action that we found. So for the West Sumino term had this had this uh, uh, contributed to this term here, and the the Hamiltonian part uh, gave this contribution. The derivative of epsilon at the Fermi surface is what one usually calls the Fermi velocity. Theta. So uh, let me just write out this result a little more cleanly. So this is what the quadratic action looks like, okay? And again, this might remind you of the action, the action of a chiral boson, a one plus one d chiral boson, that looks like phi dot dx phi plus dx phi squared, okay? So what this looks like is a bunch of chiral bosons at every point of the Fermi surface, okay? So it's, you know, you could almost have guessed this action and, and, and in fact, that's why it has been known for, for some time. But what we see is that we, we obtained this action upon linearizing uh, our full nonlinear theory. And uh, this nonlinear theory will tell you how corrections to this action will look like. So this action can be used to compute um, correlation functions of, of, of bosonic operators, for example, of the density operator, uh, like we did before in one dimension. So the density operator, again, is, is linear in phi. Um, uh, so the density operator doesn't depend on the angle theta, right? So it, it, now it involves an integral over, over the angle theta, but otherwise it's still linear in phi. So it's like summing all the little densities at every um, part of the Fermi surface. And so now we can compute this density two-point function. So it's simply, again, it's a, something that would have been a, a loop calculation in the fermion picture is now a tree-level calculation in the boson picture. But in higher dimension, unlike in 1 plus 1d, there is a remnant of this loop calculation, which is the integral over theta, which is kind of like a, a sum over the boson species, right? That there's, there's a fermion at every point of the Fermi surface. Rho is the integral over d theta of the phi's. And so there's really a sum or an integral over these two thetas. And you can perform this integral and, 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 and find the, the well-known result for the two-point function um, of, a, of a Fermi gas. 
Um, and, and I should specify that that it's uh, this, even though there's an integral, it still makes it much easier to compute this calculation. But again, this this uh, simplification is is much more uh, manifest that at um, for higher point functions for more complicated observables. So for higher point functions, it turns out that in the fermion picture, uh, it wasn't it's it wasn't even known uh, what these higher point functions scaled like as a function, you know, to what order in Q over KF they scale. Um, but this description, this Bosnian description, makes it completely manifest how they scale. So to understand these higher point functions, you need to go to the nonlinear level. Uh, I won't do this live. Uh, I've already taken enough of your time, but I'll just show you what it what it looks like. So there's um, the the action. Um, roughly looks like phi grad phi squared plus grad phi cube. We computed together this grad phi squared parts, but there's uh, kind of universal interactions that come from the West Umino term. Um, there's also interactions coming from the dispersion relation. And so it's going to have this form. The density will also be some nonlinear function of phi in general. It's going to have a grad phi squared term. And so these will lead to nonlinear response of Fermi liquids. So these uh, cubic uh, pieces in the, in the action lead to cubic vertices. And this nonlinear part of the density leads to a diagram like this. Okay, so using this, you can compute. Um, first of all, you can get the scaling of higher point functions. That's uh, in, in a trivial way; it's entirely manifest. But you can actually compute these three point functions or higher point functions uh, and, and get the kind of quantitative answer. And this is an extremely complicated calculation um, on the Fermi side. Okay, so um, that's that's what I wanted to say uh, today. I, in fact, I already went over time. Um, there's many things I haven't had a chance to say, um, but, but uh, you know, if there are questions, maybe I'll, I'll go over them a little bit. Maybe I'll just briefly mention um, this point. So the same way that you know, I showed that this, this uh, nonlinear kind of sigma model of Fermi liquids uh, reduces, to, uh, reduces to kind of bosonized, higher, higher dimensional bosonized effective filters that were known before. Uh, in a similar way, one can obtain the uh, bosonized, the linear linear bosonized algebra that had been um, discussed in, in previous literature, uh, and connect to other um, elements of, of the literature, which are all, all kind of linear approximations to this general nonlinear um, um, theory. And, and let me also just say that uh, you know I, I've talked all about Fermi liquids today, but the the hope is that these this will be a, a more a better starting point to address uh, non Fermi liquids by studying deformations of these Fermi liquids. Okay, so with this, uh, thanks a lot for your attention. I hope it wasn't too hard to follow, and I'll be happy to take more questions if you have any. Thanks, uh, Luca, for a very nice talk. Uh, interesting perspective on metals. Um, we've had many questions, um, but uh, more or less, let's see if we have more questions. So please feel free to ask uh, questions to Luca. Questions. So, uh, Rufus, uh, do you have a question, Rufus? Yes, I have a question. Thank you for the nice talk. Yeah. Um, so, you mentioned that you have trouble using this formalism for fermionic operators. So, in the case of uh, non Fermi liquids, we know that they are marginal Fermi liquids, and usually we can distinguish them from normal Fermi liquids by their self energy at low frequencies. So I have two questions. One is, can you use this sort of formalism to understand the uh, self-energy properties of non-Fermi liquids? And also, can you use it to understand, say, the heat capacity of um, these type of systems? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think heat capacity is not a problem because it's um, bosonic observable. In fact, you can, yeah, I, I didn't have time to talk much about non-Fermi liquids, but you can uh, obtain, you, you can, yeah, you can certainly study the heat capacity. Of, of, of such systems. Uh, the self, the fermion and self energy, I think is going to be a very difficult thing to approach from here. But I think you could still uh, distinguish, for example, a marginal Fermi liquid from a, a non Fermi liquid and from, from a, you know, from most non Fermi liquids and from a Fermi liquid using only bosonic observables, saying in the density, you know, response function. But um, the, the self energy of the fermion per se is not something that I think we'll have access to. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I think, you know, I, I think it probably hints like, okay, to, to be, uh, to, to, to kind of be more of, a, of, a, of an advocate of, of, of what I'm, I'm, I'm preaching. Uh, I, I think it actually hints at that there's some facts that aren't universal about Fermi liquids and non-Fermi liquids and where, where a lot of microscopic details will, will matter. 
Um, so in particular that, you know, maybe self energies will, and fermionic response functions will look very different from a Fermi liquid to another and a non Fermi liquid to another, whereas potentially uh, bosonic observables will be more universal. But that, would, that, that is one, you know, possible way of seeing what's happening. Thank you. I have maybe a, a stupid question, but um, in uh, in all the ex in all the ex concrete examples that you showed, uh, you were starting from uh, free fermions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mostly. Uh, so maybe I just missed it. Is there a, an action for this uh, Fermi liquid, uh, the the non Gaussian case? Yes. Uh, what what type of action is it? I, I, maybe yeah. you showed it and I missed it. Yes, yes, I, I didn't spend much time on it, um, um, but but indeed, yeah, there, there's a general uh, action for for Fermi liquids, which will which will look something like this, and in particular, this will include things like Landau parameters, which a free fermion wouldn't have, or you know, these things would be zero for a free fermion. Um, right. So so, so so the action is already directly written in, in terms of this uh, shape of the Fermi. Yes. Surface. It's yeah. not a, an action in terms of the fermions themselves. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Um, that may, may be uh, a minor thing. When you were showing the one plus one dimensional case, when you were having mm -hmm. that uh, scalar QED in that example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, why was the, if, if you can go back to, to mm -hmm. that yeah. slide? One. Yeah, so why is uh, phi missing the interaction with the, with the photon? So it, it is uh, interacting, right? There's an A times phi. It's term. like, oh, uh, there's, sorry, I missed. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's just that it's, the whole thing is Gaussian. So you, you could diagonalize, you know, here, here I went into some gauge to solve it, but, but you, could, you, you could even, you don't even need to go into a gauge. You can just diagonalize this, this whole action. Ah, uh, okay. I see what. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So ultimately, it comes from the fact that you know the density was linear in phi. That's where the simplification. Comes yeah. From. So a couples to density. So a times phi. You know, it's it's still quadratic. And in a way, you know, this this theory, this theory that looks interacting in the fermion picture, it looks interacting because the photon is sensitive to endpoint functions of densities, right? To multipoint functions of densities, and it turns out that these all all vanish for a reason that's not obvious in the fermion picture. Yeah, thanks. Okay, we have other questions or I can ask my question. Yeah, so uh, I have a question about the, um, the last result you were showing for the nonlinear response. Um, mm -hmm. so, so say you want to evaluate like the four point function of the density. Yeah. The Fermi liquid. Yeah. Um, so if you just, Use the Fermi gas, so just free fermions, uh, whatever shape Fermi surface, you know, and use Wick's theorem, mm -hmm. you'll get some answer for the, the four point yeah. function. Yeah. Um, and that's non zero, right? In general, four point it's function. It's non zero. That's right. That's right. It's very difficult to, so, it, you know, it, it seems pretty trivial because it's just some, some, a single loop calculation, but there are four, there, there are four propagators or, you know, n propagators for n point function. And, yeah. The point is that there's cancellations that happen once you once you anti-symmetrize. So really, you know, the the diagram. I didn't write all possible things, but there's you should also consider thing with arrows pointing in the opposite direction. Right? Um, those are the two. Really, really, you have to sum these two things. And there's a cancellation happening between these two things uh, to leading order in Q over K F. If you if you study it at small at small leap vector, and this this cancellation isn't obvious. From a single diagram, and it really comes from you know putting both things together, and 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 the number of cancellations actually increases with the number of uh, external legs. Uh, you have one cancellation for this three-point function, two cancellations for the four-point function. So you know it's a simple thing to compute formally, meaning I can I can write this as an integral over some internal you know p prime, and then I'll have a bunch of propagators, g of q plus p prime, g you know g g something like this. The, you know you can write it down for sure, and in principle you can compute it. Uh, but but the, the fact of the matter is that it's not even known, like it hasn't even been evaluated, right? It, it's not even uh, known how it scales with Q over KF at small Q. Uh, for, for the three-point function, it, it has been evaluated, but not for higher point functions. So it's calculable, but it's very complicated. I see. 
That's interesting. Um, and then, so with this approach, you can get the scaling with KF. Yeah. Uh, up to some unknown coefficient, right? Because it's an EFT. So, yeah. I think so the field for, theory has actually, some unknown. That's, well, it depends. If, you're, if you want to answer the free ferment problem, then actually we know the coefficients because we can match them using other, you know, we know that epsilon. So, so basically here. No, for the free. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, free. Yeah, for the general, no, that's right. That's right. Yeah, for the general interaction problem, you need to. And so you have these generalized Lando parameters for the higher order response functions. Um, and so can you measure, like are there experiments that are relevant for these yeah, higher that's, order? That's, yeah, 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 no, that's a good question. So you could ask, okay, in like helium three, right? Our perfect Fermi liquid, could you measure uh, these uh, higher terms? Uh, I think you could. So this is gonna involve some nonlinear response uh, because it's already cubic in F. So it's, it's certainly gonna be cubic in, in uh, well, uh, sorry, let me write it as, as delta F, something like this. Um, so, so that if you expand in phi, you'll have something like phi cube. Um, so, so it will be, it will, the F3 is, is some kind of new Landau parameter that will only enter, that will affect the nonlinear response of Fermi liquids. And in principle, yeah, it's, it's absolutely measurable. Um, uh, I don't know how easy it is to, to measure, but, but you could in principle, you know, do, do uh, I mean, like in metals, we often do nonlinear response, right? Like if you look at the resistivity, if you look at how the current response to electric field and you go beyond the linear regime, you can, you can study that. Um, yeah, I think in principle, there should be ways to, um, many ways to study this type of nonlinear response. And F3, um, so it's a function of three variables. Yeah. So this has a lot of information in principle. How, so, can so you really quantify how many degrees of freedom? Yeah, yeah. So really it's going to be three angles uh, once mm -hmm. we kind of expand around the Fermi surface, the same way that this is two angles. And the two angles of Landau parameters, usually it's just one angle if you have rotate if you have rotation symmetry, it would just be mm -hmm. f of theta one minus theta two. Um, so here, if we also have rotation symmetry, we'll have two uh, differences in angles. Two differences. So it's, so it's, uh, it's more parameters than Landau parameters, but uh, not too many. And it's some rather nice function. Uh, mm -hmm. because these are angles, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, you could expand. In fact, yeah, that's right. The same way that you expand Landau parameters and harmonics, F0, F1, so on. You could do something um, similar here with two numbers. Okay. Okay, great. Well, answers my questions. Part of my questions, I don't have any more questions. But it's, uh, and so just rapidly, what's uh, what's in your wish list using this formalism? The next, the biggest thing you can hit with. Uh, the biggest thing? Yeah, so I guess the biggest thing is. Effective action. The, the, probably the biggest goal is, is non fermi liquids. So we're, we're, we're hoping that this will be kind of actually useful to, um, you know, to understand these non fermi liquid fixed points. So at the very least, I think the perturbative approach to non-Fermi liquids can be, you know, just simply redone, like in, in this with, with this action instead of. So the way people do it now is, you know, with patch theories, uh, and it's still mm -hmm. programmatic variables, and there's a lot of cancellations happening. Um, so one one kind of yeah simple item on on the wish list is to just redo this in, uh, with this approach. Um, and then I think more generally thinking, you know, in terms of of symmetries, if one can perhaps directly constrain non-Fermi liquids without using a perturbative approach. Uh, just thinking of, of, of symmetries, and this is kind of in line with, uh, with maybe this paper, which kind of tried to think, okay, uh, Fermi liquids have this weird symmetry structure, which um, they call the LU1 anomaly. Um, does this type, can this symmetry structure survive in non-Fermi liquids? And if so, can we constrain non-Fermi liquid physics from the symmetry alone without even having an action? So this would be kind of a non-perturbative approach. So that's another like point. for conformal field theories, you know. Yeah, so something like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Conformal field theories and also like anomalies, something like you know, anomalies can constrain IR physics because there's some notion the same way that the chiral boson is, you know, very constrained by the chiral anomaly, is there something like this for Fermi or non Fermi liquids perhaps? I mean that's the perspective of, of, of this paper, but I think it's something that can be also thought about in, in, in this form. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, cool. Looking forward to seeing results along those lines. So, Lucas, merci. Uh...
the very nice talk. Um, and yeah, so uh, thanks everyone for attending.